Hello everybody, Capital Sci-Fi Con Virtual Edition 2021. So for something a little bit different now, we're going to have an interval interview with our favourite friend, James McKenzie, aka Raven. How are you doing, James? I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this. This is uh, uh, slightly strange, but um, wonderful. So thank you for having me. <laughs> Yeah, it's slightly different having to do a virtual edition. Um, it's uh, we're getting used to it now. We've done a couple of interviews um, so far, so um, so yeah, it's it's going well so far. Um, and I'm hoping that everybody's enjoying their day, uh, tuning in for the for the virtual edition. Um, so obviously, James, you have been a long term supporter of Capital Sci Fi Con. Um, you, you've been coming to us for a few years now. What what is it you enjoy about Capital Sci Fi Con? Um, I know you do a lot of conventions, but what is it you like about Capital? Um, well, without stating the obvious one of it actually being local, which is always amazing, um, I, it's it's the people, you know. Like, uh, you know, I had the the misfortune a few years ago to get to know yourself, and <laughs> uh, and realizing what it was you did and what you'd created and why and who it was for kind of made it absolutely kind of imperative to me that uh, if I could help out and be part of, I would. Um, uh, I, you know, I'd heard of Chaz over the years, but didn't know too much about it. And then everyone on the kind of convention circuit that I knew said, oh my goodness, you need to, to go to Capital Sci-Fi. And so I came along the first year and was just absolutely blown away uh, I mean just from from an organizational point of view and from the attendance the fans the people that were there and um, the way it was run the way it was so accessible for for um, fans and for for, for um, <clears throat> people to come along to uh, yeah but most importantly for, for the whole reasoning behind it you know it's so often these days you you, you kind of come across these things that are that are all kind of commercial and you know for profit and to know that this is was an entirely uh, for non-profit um organization and and what it was doing uh it just kind of drew me in and 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 i've kind of been uh hanging about you like a bad smell since really <laughs> uh yeah i think it's just it's vital it's vital what you do but it's so important and it's but also it's just uh it's such an amazing uh, weekend that you have with Capital. I mean, you, you get to meet all the, the the people, the attendees, and the fans and stuff, and that's always brilliant. But it's just got such a lovely, warm atmosphere. You know, it's so friendly, and um, and also there's loads of cool guests. I mean, you know, like uh, you can't help but um, kind of fanboy, you know, when you're there. You know, so yeah, it's just it's a brilliant, brilliant thing, and. You know the amount of money that you guys have have raised over the years is is kind of mind blowing. You know, and it's it's for all the right reasons. You know, no one's pockets are being lined. It's just, I think I think that's what generally gives it the. It's kind of, oh, I don't know. It just feels like it gives you a really big hug. Do you know what I mean? I know that sounds kind of simple, but it's it's great, and and it makes you feel good because you're. You're doing something for, for the greater good, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so that's the short to... answer. That's the short. <laughs> no, that's that's good. Because you mention a hug, and obviously across the whole weekend, the capital sci-fi con, the amount of people that come up and hug me, um, and and they're thoroughly enjoying it, and they know that they're they're raising money for charity at the same time. And I think you're right. It does give you that feel good factor that. People are coming along to the convention. They're looking yeah. to have a good time, but they're they're doing good at the same time. Um, and and obviously we we look at you as as part of the team now because we we class you as one of our patrons who come along and support the event. And you you are so um, easy to talk to, uh, so friendly, and and we love being with you at Meal with the Stars as well, um, which, which is uh, another highlight of the weekend for us because you get to speak to yourself and all the other guests in a totally different environment over a, a lovely three-course meal and a couple of drinks. And 
raising money um, through the auctions as well. Um, and I know that all our guys love you um, for the bottom of their heart at, our, at the Meal with the Stars and, and stuff like that. So um, I think everybody would be happy for me to say that to you and, and say that you're, you're a very cherished member of the team. Well, uh, that's very kind, slightly embarrassing, but uh, absolutely like a million times right back at you. It's uh, I've kind of accidentally fallen into being part of Capital Sci-Fi and and by by effect Chaz and uh, but I couldn't be happier being associated with it and and I think yeah I think probably in the last few years as well you know having you know being a parent as well I think it, it just it kind of it, it made sense and it was it was one it was kind of requests and and being part of something that you couldn't really say no to you know yeah yeah and obviously you you've said that you fell in love with Chaz as well um and that was evident when you uh, went on your Sahara trek didn't you yes Yes, yeah, I was, I, I was the, foolishly Chaz decided to ask me <laughs> and not like, I don't know, Peter Paldi or something, you know, but uh, it was, yeah, I mean, when, when they got in touch and asked me, I kind of thought it was a wind up at first, really. I mean, you know, how, how could you say no to, to A, be part of helping raise funds for Chaz, but then traveling to a different continent and trekking through the Sahara Desert. I mean, it's kind of like a no-brainer. Even, yeah. I mean, and it was it was our, my kind of family's kind of busiest time of the year, you know, it was approaching Panto season when my wife's an actor and, 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 and I am obviously. And so, you know, it's the time of the year when we're crazy busy, but even my wife said, oh my God, you've got to do this. It would be, it'd be crazy not to. And, and she was saying that knowing that she was going to be left with childcare, panto rehearsals, a house to run and two dogs to look after. But she was just like, go, 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 you've, you've got to do this. And so, yeah, I I travelled with 21 perfect strangers to, to the Sahara Desert and we we all shacked up together in tents and trekked through the desert um, for, you know, in, all day for five days, sleeping under the stars. And it was just a, a mind-blowingly phenomenal experience. And to be doing that for a charity like Chaz was was a real privilege and honour and and um, and to help raise uh, some 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 cash for them was was uh, was yeah it was a it was a privilege so yeah and you know I mean I got to climb the highest sand dunes in the in the Sahara and watch the sunrise you know and with and also I think what was more was really humbling about it was. Um, you know, like I say, we'd, we'd been 21 strangers, but we very quickly were, were very close friends. Um, and partly because we had to be, but also just because it was a lovely bunch of people. But being up there that morning on the, on this, on the, the Chicago dunes watching the sunrise and, you know, I was, I was pretty much the only one there representing Chaz who, who wasn't there for a, for a personal reason. Yeah. You know, I was, uh, I was just the, the hanger on. Uh, off the telly, so to speak, you know, and so it was really humbling to be there and 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 being allowed to be part of a very very personal experience for some people who had lost children or nieces and nephews and sisters and brothers and and that was yeah I mean I'll I'll, I'll never forget that 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 moment of sitting on top of the dune and watching the sunrise and and just. I was being able to com contemplate certain things in my life and certain losses I'd gone through, but being allowed to be part of that was something was something really special, a real privilege, and yeah, and and just a kind of game changer. Really, it was just a, a, a once in a lifetime experience. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I think that's that's one of the things that I tend to appreciate as well is that uh, a lot of people ask me. Um, what my connection to Chaz is, and, and I, I don't, I don't have one. Um, luckily, my, my children have never had to use the hospice, um, and and it, it, I think it baffles people sometimes um, because I've I've not had a family member use the hospice or anything like that, um, and and I think people wonder why um, I, I chose Chaz, and and it was just that first visit going there and. 
and meeting the families um, and sharing special times with the families. And sadly, a lot of the children that I've met are, are no longer here um, and attending funerals and, and stuff like that. And like you said, it's just being able to be a part of the family's lives and create beautiful memories for them to carry on um, that when they've been to capital. Um, and, and like yourself saying on the, on the Sahara trek, you were, you were there with people um, and they're letting you share their special moments with you. And I think it's such a, it's such a special thing um, to be allowed um, to be part of people's lives who have, who have gone through loss and gone through traumas. Um, and, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful just to spend time with people and, and be on their journey with them. Um, so Absolutely. I can understand what you're talking about. Um, I remember, I remember in the, I remember in the run up to, to going to the Sahara, Jazz asked me to, to visit uh, Robin House out at, out at Bala. And I was so nervous. I was, I was dreading it. Like I'd never been yeah. to a hospice before and certainly not one for children. And I was absolutely dreading it. And, but of course I, I felt like I had to go, you know, and honestly, I was totally blown away. Like it's, I thought it was going to be, Oh, I don't know. I was yeah, I was nervous. I thought, my God, it's going to be so um, uh, upsetting and um, really difficult and awkward. And my goodness, I've never been to a happier place in my life. I was, yeah. I mean, I literally was blown away. I mean, they'd in in the twelve hours previous to to me visiting, they'd they'd sadly lost two of the two of the residents. Uh, but honestly, I, I I came into this building that just and kind of exuded warmth and love and happiness. I mean, the facilities are mind blowing and second to none and what they offer families and what they offer a lot of parents or relatives as, as respite as well is, is just phenomenal. But just the facilities, but just like, the, honestly, like I've never felt like a building emanate positivity yeah. and happiness before. And I was totally blown away by it. I mean, I, I left in such a good mood it was <laughs> and also i mean it just totally it totally redoubled my my desire and willingness and drive to to to, to raise as much money as i could for yeah. for for the sahara check as you know but yeah it was an amazing experience and uh, yeah i mean i count that i mean that visiting the the, the hospice that day it, it's kind of on the same kind of experience as, as being in the sahara you know it was it was, it was yeah. really uh, enriching yeah, yeah. Totally understand where you're coming from there. Um, but obviously the, the, the thing that everybody's wanting to, to talk about is um, being Raven. <laughs> how did all that come about, James? How, how did it all come about you becoming the, the iconic character? Uh, well, I, mean, I was very lucky. It happened towards the end of my time at, um, at drama school at Queen Margaret in Edinburgh. Um, long story short, I, I was very lucky to be a, a professional actor from quite a young age. I, I started acting professionally when I was about 15. Um, and so subsequently I had an agent. Uh, but I got to a, and I got to my late teens, early 20s, and I decided that if I never, if I didn't go to drama school now, I might possibly never. And I wanted to, I wanted to learn more, but also I wanted to have that life experience of being a student, you know. Um, so I was very lucky to have an agent all the way through drama college, um, which wasn't uh, always um, greatly received by the rest of my uh, colleagues but uh, in drama school, but there we are, such is the way. Um, but so I was in my last term of drama school and my agent phoned to say that BBC Scotland were auditioning for a new children's television programme. And basically they were looking for male actors who were Scottish with dark hair. And that was it, really, because they, they, they didn't know, know what they wanted. They were seeing actors from kind of 18 right up to kind of actors in their 40s and 50s. So they, um, so I went along and, and then I, I got a recall and, yeah, then I got the job. And so I, I remember graduating from, from drama school on the Friday and, and starting, starting pre-production and filming for Raven the, the, the following week. So... It was very, very surreal, um, but yeah, amazing, amazing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and it's, it's funny because whenever we announce um, that you're coming to Capital Sci-Fi Con, the amount of 
people that tag other people, oh my God, it's Raven, it's Raven. And, and it just, it stirs up so many emotions for, for young people who watch the programme and then the parents who were probably in the room with the kid when they watched the programme. So it, it's, a, it's across a, a large age span of people that are, that are big fans of Raven. Um, and you, you're always saying hello to somebody and chatting to somebody. Uh, you are a true fan's favourite. Oh, that's that's lovely. I mean, yeah, I think it's it's a, it's a funny one because I think Raven originally when they when it was in kind of pre-production and when it was being pitched, I think the idea was that it would be kind of appealing to <clears throat> kind of nine, ten year olds up to maybe kind of thirteen, fourteen. Yeah. And what happened was just like you say is that it, it ended up appealing to kind of five year olds right up to 85 year olds because what would happen was is that kids would watch it with their little brothers and, brothers and sisters but they would also watch it maybe with their parents or indeed their grandparents yeah. you know and so it kind of it kind of went right across the 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 the, the age span uh, and you know I think it appealed a lot to to a lot of kids you know with it's kind of um the, the medieval kind of uh mythical side of it the but the fantasy side, the kind of Lord of the Rings esque kind of idea, but also kids, you know, because it was also a kind of fantasy game show as well. So kids were watching at home, going, "I could do that. <laughs> I want to do that. I could jump out that tree. I could, yeah. I could defeat the way of the warrior. I could swim through that loch." And parents and grandparents loved it because it was all about kids being outside and outdoors yeah. and being active and not, you know, sitting in front of a a computer and, and stuff like that. So yeah, I think I think that it had a a, a a really broad appeal. Yeah. Yeah, definitely did. Definitely did. I never got the phone call. I'm Scottish. I had dark hair and I know yeah. what, but I mean people often get you and I confused. I know. You know, yes. Especially with the, especially when I've got the raven beard. I mean I, I, little, <laughs> I mean just a, a little bit more hair, but you know Yeah, just a little bit. A little bit. <clears throat> um but yeah and and obviously um you went on from one show to Molly and Mac. Um, again, that was when, when my, my daughter saw you at Capital Sci-Fi Con and you, you we all sung, I have an idea. But again, it, it's, it, you just seem to pick these show-stopping programmes that are, are a, an absolute hit. Um, and how did you enjoy your time on, on Molly and Mac? Oh, I, yeah, well, I mean, like you say, very lucky. Uh, um, to, to be part of another kind of successful and and, and very well received children's program, uh, yeah, Molly and Mac again. I mean, Raven will always hold a very very special place in my life. But now, Molly and Mac is also up there because you know my little boy watches it and a lot of his friends and stuff. And yeah, it's a, it's a special little program. Um, I think it's it kind of pitches it really just right, you know, with a bit of story and drama, but songs and music and silliness as well. And yeah, yeah, I mean, we've we've done two series, and I'm actually, as we speak, uh, currently in the middle of filming another two series just now. I'm um, very lucky to be to be working in the middle of a of a pandemic. You know, it's been a it's been a tough uh, kind of year for for a lot of people in my business, and 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 our industry has been. Uh, pretty much on its knees you know so the fact that I was able to to start filming for Molly and Mac at the, at the tail end of, of last year has, has been a real um a real godsend um but it's just lovely it's lovely to be back and you know singing the songs and and getting up to lots of silliness and kind of crazy Molly and Mac ideas it's 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 brilliant and yeah the fact that it's it, I think it, it kind of became a it's a bit of a what they call a, a sleeper hit you know I, I, they didn't I think the BBC didn't necessarily expect it to be as popular as it as it has become, and uh, and I kind of like that. It kind of reminds me a bit of of, of Raven in, in yeah. that kind of terms, and and yeah, just, again, kids and parents alike are, have kind of fallen in love with it, and yeah, I'm 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 very thankful to be part of that, and it's it's a lovely thing to be to 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 be part of and to have on your CV. And it's you know it's great fun. I mean, I get to I get to do all sorts of stuff, and you know, I, <clears throat> I get to you know I'm you know dressed as a giant broad bean in one episode, <laughs> and you know, and just silliness. But it's yeah, just it's so much fun, and it's and it's you know the, the kids love it. So 
It's good fun. Brilliant. Brilliant. Right. Well, uh, James McKenzie, thank you very much for coming along and doing this interview with us today. Um, we all at Capital Sci-Fi Con wish you the best of luck for the rest of the year. We hope that all your filming and everything else goes absolutely to plan for you. Um, you're an absolute legend. You're an absolute gent. And we look forward to having you back at physical events again in the future. Well, I can't can't wait to be back. Uh, thank you uh, for having me on here. Uh, I hope everybody's having a fantastic virtual Capital Sci-Fi Con this year. Um, uh, be good, stay safe, and give Capital Sci-Fi and Chaz all your cash. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, James McKenzie. Thank you, James. Thank you. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen, for the rest of the evening. We're here right through till 10 p.m. this evening. We've got lots of great Q&As coming up, lots of entertainment, um, and we will be finishing off with an extravaganza at the end of this evening. Stay tuned, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you.